Welcome to It's a Woman's World, a show which discusses any and all topics under the sun from a woman's point of view. Our moderator today is Dr. Susan Strauss. Hi, and welcome to It's a Woman's World, and have we got some great guests for you today. But first of all, I'd like to introduce my co-host for the day, Nadia Giordana. Hi, happy to be here. Yeah, glad you are. And Gail Roddy. Hello there. Hi, Gail. Glad to see you. Gail and I just found out we're neighbors. Yeah. Well, we were anyway. <laughs> and we also have Dr. Artika Tyner. Hi, Artika. Hello. Good to see you. Hello. And Cynthia Fraction. Yes. Good to have you here, too. Glad to be here. And we've got some interesting information from both of these women that are going to enlighten us. Well, I'm so fascinated, Dr. Atika, that you are an attorney and now you are also an author and the things you write about are leadership, which of course go hand in hand, but I'm fascinated to find out how did you come to be an author? I became an author out of my own passion. I'm a civil rights attorney by training and I realized that there is an opportunity to talk more about how to leverage our leadership to advance social change. To really look at opportunities to say, I would like to change the world but to take the action and have the initiative and the tools to make that change come to fruition. And so you wanted, I take it, to reach a broader audience because as you're working an attorney, as an attorney, you do reach a certain audience, but as an author, you can reach people around the world. That's truly been my goal, to be able to reach people near and far, and especially to empower students. Because most students, whether they're coming to law school for the first time, they had a sense of, what can we do to bring forth justice? Mm -hmm. An engineering student, how can we problem solve to make the world a better place? So really tapping into the passion of students and saying you can be the leader, that will make the change. You don't have to wait. I know Mother Teresa talked about that. Don't wait for leaders. To really start with yourself, looking at that man or the woman in the mirror and saying how you can make a change. Are, well, the, students, are the students your primary audience or does it really go right through to persons who are in the workaday world and wanting to take on leadership roles? Good question. It's truly a diversity related to my audience. Mm -hmm. Now primarily as an educator, my first audience was students. I thought to myself, if I, in my ideal world, I could have every student in my classroom. But the reality is, I really needed a, a mechanism and a way to reach students both near and far. But also really the challenge was to meet everyday people. To say, if you'd like to change the school board, maybe you can run for office, mm -hmm. maybe you can advocate, maybe you can change policies. So. A part of writing both of my books was really empowering everyday people to say, if you see an issue, you can create a solution. Now, I know that you are the director of the Diversity and Inclusion Program at St. Thomas. Is that the correct term, director? Yes, that's yep. correct. Okay, so I know that you're doing that. And then you're also teaching, is it just law students or do you teach on a broader scope than law students? Well, primarily in my role, I've been teaching law students and public policy students, okay. and additionally students in our international leadership program. Okay. But as I've gone on the book tour and talked about the books, I've traveled everywhere from China to Tanzania oh, really? to talk to students, undergraduate students, and people in the community who are looking to make a change and make a difference. How wonderful to have that international experience. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And speaking about the books, maybe you can tell yes. us, I know that you had written one earlier about the lawyer as a leader that came mm -hmm. out last year. And now tell us about the new one, A Leader's Journey, A Guide to Discovering the Leader Within. Tell us about that. Well, this particular book is a companion to the first book. Now, the first book was really a blueprint on how to advance social change, what steps you need to cultivate as a leader, and how to influence policies. I talked about some of my work in influencing policies in both the criminal justice and education system. And then my reader said, well, how do I take the next step? Okay, these are great tools, great strategies, but what can I do in my everyday life to become an effective leader? So the second book is really like having a virtual coach, a leadership coach right there alongside you to help you discover what your passions are, to discover what your individualized gifts and talents are, and more importantly, how to build a bit vision for the future and draw others with you and empower them to lead as well. So building some strategic coalitions. Is that the book that you, where you use quotes as tools? 
Yes. Now this book you could use as your daily guide for mm -hmm. leadership. It's composed of a number of different quotes from leaders all around the world. And I also wanted to ensure to do something unique for this particular book, to draw upon the diversity of leaders. So okay. there's women leaders, like Sheryl Sandberg, to talk mm -hmm. about the diversity of women, lead women leadership as well. There's diverse leaders uh, in the sense of you have a Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, talking about that sense of what does it mean to be not just a leader but a servant mm -hmm. and to be the type yeah. of servant mm -hmm. that would advance social change in the arena of civil rights. So I also was very intentional of having diverse voices here in the book as well. Do you have your students read the book? I do, yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, I use this book as a conversation starter in class. Okay. You can start with one of these quotes. As an individual, it could be your opening reflection of your day to say, how can I apply some of the leadership principles to my life? But as an educator, it's kind of a secret tool to get everyone talking. Yeah, so you much. can start with just a few moments of students thinking about what does the quote mean to them? How does it relate to their current readings? Mm -hmm. But it gets students thinking and engaged. Do, do the law students ever think about themselves as a leader. I, I would think, now I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I work with lawyers, but I, I don't always think of lawyers as a leader in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. I may think of it more in the courtroom or playing a role with getting um, a positive opinion for their case, but do your students think of themselves as leaders? That's an excellent question. I think it first started with redefining the notion of leadership. Because traditionally when we think about leadership, it's about power, it's about position, it's mm -hmm. about a title. But one of the challenges that I outline in both of the books and even my own teaching is truly the reality is we need to redefine leadership. Mm -hmm. And think about leadership as a process of influence. Now we all just sitting here today, we all may have different measures of that influence, but we each have the capacity to create change, whether big or small, whether internally with ourselves to become more empowered or externally in social change movements or going specifically to lawyers, that commission that we have. I mean, we are the gatekeepers of justice. Mm -hmm. That goes beyond just being in a courtroom. Is looking at the reality to say, what does the essence of justice mean? What is equal justice under the law? How do we do pro bono services to meet the needs of those who can't mm -hmm. afford legal mm -hmm. services? Mm -hmm. Those are all leadership opportunities. So in a sense, I think traditionally, maybe students hadn't seen themselves as leaders, but my hope is as we reimagine legal education, education more broadly, that we're combining principles of leadership and social justice advocacy to say your training is a tool to advance social change. How, how did you get involved in all that? Where, where is your interest with <laughs> civil rights and how did you get into this and diversity and inclusion and being at a university? How come you're not practicing law, so to speak, <laughs> in the traditional sense? Well, I think I've never been quite the traditional person. Mm -hmm. When they talk about think outside of the box, I always jumped outside of the box okay. completely. And I looked at the full landscape and becoming an educator, it was a, mm -hmm. an opportunity to empower, to equip, and train the next generation of leaders. And becoming an attorney, it was getting out of the box again. I could have easily said, you know, the challenges that, that were facing my community, whether it was related to poverty, lack of access to education, health care, the war on drugs. I could have said, isn't that just a, a shame? Let me just earn my law degree and just move on. But the reality was I earned my law degree to use it as a tool to advance my community to bring healing, to bring restoration, to create opportunities. So when I talk about it now, now I love superheroes, so I give this as a sense of being Miss Freedom Fighter Esquire. <laughs> Basically Wonder Woman with a law degree and an afro. And when I think of this, it really gives me the enthusiasm and the passion to say, unleash your inner superhero. Mm -hmm. Now for me, of course, it's my law training and my training in public policy and as an educator, but we each have a measure of influence, again, that superpower to be able to change and to create changes, both big and small. So for me, it was just living out my passion and my education really has been the tools to let me be effective at unleashing that superpower of change and justice. Well, and it sounds like and having been an educator myself, it's one way to really influence a broad range of up and coming students mm -hmm. and hopefully they Agreed. will hear your philosophy and y what your knowledge base is mm -hmm. and you can impart that to them and they then can carry it and you get that whole ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is true. I actually talk about this in The Leader's Journey. In the final chapter, I highlight that truly the measure of leadership 
is not what I do today. It's the legacy that happens long after I'm gone. It's those seeds that have been planted that never die, that take root, where someone says, yes, I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can take a stand. And I've been equipped and empowered to make that change happen. So for me, I look at truly my future and my legacy are the seeds that I plant in each of my individual students. Mm -hmm. So it's a blessing to see it now. I mean, there's some who are commissioners. There's some in other elected roles. There are some that are doing traditional private practice, public policy work, traveling around the world. So you're already hearing from some who have followed some of the things that they've learned from you. I have, yes. I have, and it's exciting to see, really seeing that the St. Thomas mission is continuing to impact generations of students and saying, how can we promote the common good mm -hmm. in a practical mm -hmm. way? Mm -hmm. So in your travels with the book, and you've said you've gone all over the world, now have this been in a university setting? that you've traveled to? Primarily, yes. And the opportunities, whether it's taking our students abroad or even going abroad to lecture as well, challenging okay. university students with those same principles. And one simple question I ask every student I meet is what is in your hands to make a difference in the world? Mm. Now, some may not be able to answer it initially, but I hope by the end of our conversation, they get a sense of that there's power in their hands. Mm -hmm. And if they're willing to tap into that power, they can make the type of change that we all would like to see, to make a just world, to make a world where we can talk about peace and freedom and liberty for all people. And that really is the bottom line, isn't mm -hmm. it? We yes. all have a, an ability to make a change, mm -hmm. every one of us. Agreed. Well, tell us a little bit about your international travels. You said something about you did bring some students with you, or tell us about that. And what, what kind of a response do you get from the international community about your work, your, your passion. My most recent travels were this past summer. I traveled to the World Academy for the Future of Women in China. Oh. So I was in the Hunan province, and it's a beautiful land full of just great history of the dynasties and looking at the, the past and looking ahead to the future with a lot of optimism. And for me, the students were very receptive. They were hungry for knowledge on how to become more effective leaders. Now, each of the students that I worked with at the World Academy had a service learning project. Ah. Their projects were based upon the UN Millennium development goals mm -hmm. with making an impact with things for instance like maternal health making sure that you know women ha can have safe childbirth all the way to looking at issues like child literacy mm -hmm. and increasing ex access to education Which so it, we're not doing well on those millennium goals with education mm -hmm. for girls especially we're not I mean definitely more progress to be made so I was very you know excited and enthralled to see the momentum of these students to say let's not just say we're not making progress as we'd like to because now we we didn't reach the goals by by some of our targets but the reality is they said let's keep going let's keep pressing forward and not just for our small teams of our service learning teams but let's go university wide let's go throughout the nation let's go throughout the world to say that get started where you are make an impact and continue to see it grow. Were, were these just Chinese students or were these students from different parts of um Asia, for example, or different parts of the world? Primarily Chinese students. Mm -hmm. Now the students that I taught were in the advanced academy, so they were rising juniors and seniors who also were thinking about that earlier piece that I talked about, the legacy. How would their projects continue after they've graduated? Right. So really looking at empowering others based upon the shared vision of justice and moving people closer to their own leadership potential. So for me, that was very transformational just to see that process mm -hmm. play out step by step. Step. The mm -hmm. students were teaching each other about leadership, learning the team building skills, learning the analytical skills, and more importantly, learning the type of problem solving skills that they could keep for a lifetime in making an impact. How exciting for you. Dr. Artika, I hear that you had a TED talk. Tell us how that came about. That must have been fascinating to do. It was an amazing experience, and truly it was one of my students who encouraged me to submit an application. And she said, well, Dr. Tyner, you're always talking about challenging yourself, making a difference. Here's your opportunity to share your message with the world. And my message was simple. The theme was reimagining education. And I talked about my dream of what education truly did for me was it empowered me to make a difference. It empowered me to say that I could build a stronger community and make an impact. And empowered me to become a civil rights attorney. So when I think about reimagining education, it's with placing an explicit focus on leadership development and social justice advocacy. 
to prepare the next generation, take the mantle of leadership, and move us closer to a vision of liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Yeah. It's exciting. And that's actually a segue into Cynthia Fraction. Now, Cynthia is the director, I need to get this right, for the Excel Research Scholars Program at the University of St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, I read what it is that you do with this scholars program, and it was like, I want to go on that trip. <laughs> I want to take that, yeah. that one class that you talked about, about going down south. Can you tell our viewers about that? It sounds yeah. phenomenal. Sure. Well, let me back up and tell you a little bit about the program. The Excel mm. Research Scholars Program used to be what was called the Ronald E. McNair Post Baccalaureate Achievement Program, which is actually the last um, of a series of programs that um, is a federally funded program. If you've heard of TRIO programs at all, they um, you have Upper Bound and Student Support Services and different programs like, yes. that, that, like that that work for first generation, low income, underrepresented by race students to help, or, or just students in general who are disadvantaged, to help them get into college, to help them be successful in college. And then what we would do um, when we had McNair was we would go off and help students get into graduate school ah, okay. um, with the goal to them to create their PhDs. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, and so we, at the, at the end of the first five years of our um, program, we started at St. Thomas in 2008. There are 194 throughout the nation. Um, we had our first grant in 2008. When that grant ended, as we, you know, like everybody else, we went forward to get our um, our next grant, and uh, we lost the competition by less than a third of a point. Oh, no. Um, and a lot, lot of it had to do with the fact that um, there were changes in Washington, right. and so a lot of schools had lost their grant that really were doing fabulous jobs. Um, we're not upset about it at St. Thomas because we're blessed to have had um, the opportunity to keep our program going and hence mm -hmm. we now have Excel. We have trained to date um, 74 students um, and um, about three-fourths of them have gone on to graduate schools. Great. Um, top flight institutions like University of Michigan Ann Arbor, Brown University. Um, we have a young lady working on her PhD in um, at Mayo Clinic. Oh. Um, there's just, I mean, wonderful success. Wonderful success. Our first graduates in their doctoral programs uh, came out this year. One, uh, two who got pharmacy uh, degrees at the University of Minnesota. Um, and just a number of things are happening. We've just graduated a lot of, lot of kids. That must yes. just warm your heart mm -hmm. to see it the does. success. It does. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, it, you know, I don't have children, but those are still my babies. Yeah. You know? So yes. it's exciting. Um, but when we talk about the trip now, when we became Excel, just as we were coming off of the um, um, last year of the Ronald E. McNair Post Baccalaureate Achievement Program, um, I ended up reporting it to a new um, person, and this person um, uh, gave me the opportunity to advance my research, mm -hmm. which is also around the civil rights movement. I like looking at um, um, studying the civil rights movement and how it influences um, students um, and empowers them. Mm -hmm. My research uh, thesis was on how, Af how wisdom and spirituality oh. um, centered on the civil rights movement would influence African American women. And so I studied wow. that and um, as a result of that um, we decided to go forward to pilot this actual study tour of the American Civil Rights Movement. So now during the month of January, we take the students in the program down south for 13 days to actually Do you do it every year? Every year. And, every year. And I was reading about what this entails. Can you yeah. tell our viewers because it's powerful? It is very mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very powerful. We, we start off um, in Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and um, we, we meet with foot soldiers, um, people who were actually on the front lines of the movement. And the fun thing about the trip is I'm always, every year, meeting somebody new. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I actually ran into a woman who gave us a tour of the city of Memphis, which has been very exciting. You're learning um, not only um, about what happened during the movement, but you're actually there in those places, walking in the home. We went into um, what was called the slave haven, a place where mm. um, people, slaves, when they were um, 
running for freedom. There was a, a, a gentleman who owned a little house about three blocks from the river, and they'd come into the back door. Right at the back door, there was a trap, and they'd crawl under the house, and they would get through a small little hole and hide there for months oh. beneath the house. He then made boxes and would put them into boxes, take them down to the river, and put them on cargoes and they would uh, sail on into um, Canada for oh freedom. Oh my God. Um, very exciting. So the kids get a chance to sit actually right down in there. Mm -hmm. um, we will go from there into Oxford, Mississippi over to Ole Miss and study the James Meredith story. Um, hear from um, Professor Curtis Wilkie, um, mm -hmm. who was actually there. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know who he yes, is? Yeah, yes, so I he do. actually, he, he met with us. Wow. And uh, it was very exciting to hear from him. He's a very prominent civil rights um, author, uh, journalist. And so from there we would go on, um, we we'd go to places like the uh, Delta Blues Museum. We want to learn about music and how music was a part of that. Yes. Students got a chance, I'll, I'll never forget the first year we went and the kids said, why is the ground so white? I mean, they don't get snow in the south, do they? And I said, that would be cotton, what you're looking oh, at. Mm -hmm. sure. And so we stopped the bus and they got a chance to pick cotton. Mm. and mm -hmm. get a feel for what does that really look like? What mm -hmm. is it? Mm -hmm. um, and so from there we go into Jackson, Mississippi. Many of them um, have not been to historically black colleges. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Jackson State right. uh, University and to the Coffell Center um, and, and to be able to go into Meg Rivers' home. And we'd hear mm -hmm. and from other freedom, uh, excuse me, foot soldiers who would um, um, teach us freedom songs and songs that you've heard. This little light of mine, I'm mm -hmm. gonna let it shine. Mm -hmm. And you know, but what did that mean during the movement? Um, the importance of this trip, I go on about that. The importance of this tour is for young people in the program to first and foremost understand that the program that you're in is something that is, is stemming from what people did years ago. To give you the opportunity to do what they weren't able to do, number one. Number two, we still have our struggles on our college campuses. Um, being um, a minority, if you will, in a classroom, um, but do we go in and, and, and complain or, or be upset or, or draw back or mm -hmm. do we step forth? and become leaders. So I like for them to hear yes, from yes. those people who went out there. So we meet numerous people, people who were heads of SNCC, um, people who actually slept outside and and protested, and some people who, and we would sit in a classroom and they would hear a book drop, just like that, and they'd flinch. Yes. Because they mm -hmm. think it's a gunshot, you know, and What's been rich about the trip is that we would do things like go to 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Um, we'd study the Children's Crusade. Uh, we would study the four little girls who died in the bombing. Um, but then we would go to church. And many of them have not been in a black church. Um, one young man who was Ethiopian um, said, I'm an atheist and I, I, it's not that I don't believe in God, I just have not had that experience, that exposure. Um, and he came out and I said, so how you feeling? And he said, right now I'm wrestling with my spirituality. Well, mm -hmm. and having been to a black church, mm -hmm. it's like, I hope the rest of the churches celebrate <laughs> like that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I've, I've got a question for yeah. you. Could this kind of a program ever be opened up to the public? Yeah. I would love to go. Has St. Thomas thought about that? Yeah, you know, I get, I get that question so often um, that that's the next step. And I, I was listening to Dr. Artika talk about leadership, leadership, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm from South Minneapolis. South mm -hmm. Minneapolis and our Martin Luther King um, Park, which is the area where I'm from, the Kingfield area, just redid their park and they created a, um, a uh, playground that's all um, centered around the Civil Rights Movement, um, which is kind of exciting. And I thought, you know what, it's time for me to go over there and see how we make this a, a public thing. Can we get people on the bus now? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to go. Yes. And um, it, it's just important. It's, we need to do it. You know, I, like I told you before we were starting, I was in high school during the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever remember any of our teachers addressing this with us. And it was during that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in a small 
com community in Minnesota, all white. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen a black person. Um, then I got married and moved down to Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, okay. And worked mm -hmm. in the operating room when Martin Luther King was killed and mm. worked with many blacks. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to learn about it, but I thought, I, we had our 50th high school reunion, and I was asking my friends, do you remember us mm -hmm. ever learning about this? I never heard this? a word. Mm -hmm. and, no, and they all said, too, no. Mm -hmm. what, what a shame mm -hmm. that we that we didn't. And I'm guessing back in the 60s and in a small town, they thought, oh, this doesn't impact us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my guess. Mm -hmm. And what a shame. I feel that we lost out on it. So to hear you talk about this, and I've tried to see the movies, and I know they're movies. Yeah. I've learned a lot just by watching movies. I've been trying to read about it, but mm -hmm. I would love to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to have to pull this together. What came to my mind is, on the trip, did you run into ordinary citizens oh, yeah. that lived there? Oh, that's yeah. another oh, yeah, story yeah. I would love. Yes. Oh, white and black. Oh, yes. Citizens yes. Citizens that yes. were there at that time. Maybe absolutely. Children. Yeah. Oh yeah, that are grown up now. Absolutely, abso oh absolutely. We we run. I mean, we run into them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what's very exciting for me to watch is, you know, when we're down south, the South is pretty still very black, very white. You know, so they're very segregated in yep. many areas. Um, and I'm bringing. Hmong students and yeah. Ethiopian oh, students yeah. and Mali students down and so when they see these students it's you know that the reaction is very interesting and so um, it's it's having class on the trip and helping them to you know this this talk through what you experienced mm -hmm. um, and and how they were approached we had a young lady who was Somali um, we were coming back last year from the tour and um, and uh, the, we had a white student on the tour as well. His, when we were coming home from Atlanta, his driver's license had expired. Nobody said anything. Her driver's license had expired. <gasps> Clipped the corner, she had her yellow slip, and they would not let her through. Oh, oh my Very my interesting. Word. So we had to deal with yes. that. It yeah. was very yeah. interesting. Yeah. What I would say, and just kind of um, responding to you know your own experience, and really a lot of our experiences growing up, um, learning about the movement. The Southern Poverty Law um, Center will tell you yes. that we don't have in America, um, in K through 12, um, standards that are set that say these are the things that you should be teaching students about the civil rights movement. And I think we hear about that mm -hmm. when you hear about what the South is trying to do in their history yeah. books to sort of rewrite the whole mm -hmm. history perspective mm -hmm. just bothers me and I just mm -hmm. am sick about it but we're all out of time. Yeah. Yeah. And this we has been talk so about this interesting. Yeah. We it's just could. Exciting. So um, Dr. Tyner, and Cynthia, thank you so much thank you. Thank for you. telling us about leadership and telling us about the um, Excel program at St. Thomas. Thank and you just get it for <laughs> the public. Yes. And Nadia <laughs> and Gail, thank you for joining me. Thank you. And thank you for joining It's a Woman's World. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.